All right, if you would open your Bibles to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 1. Anybody like Lucas? The Apostle Lucas? Yes, he's a good man. And I wrote some good books. Luke is one of them. How many know another book that Luke wrote? Anybody want to tell me? He wrote the book of Acts as well. So um, we're going to look at one of his books, and, and it's one of the, uh, the Gospels of Jesus Christ right here. And um, there are four Gospels. Anybody know the four Gospels? Come on, somebody. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Just a little Bible trivia just for a moment. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So this morning we're going to look at Luke. And we started a series um, at the beginning of the summer um, called Heroes or Uncommon Heroes. And so we've taken some time to look at those that are heroes of our faith according to Scripture. And, And we've looked at a few different people. Anybody remember some of the people that we've looked at? Anybody remember? We looked at Joseph just last week, um, the Good Samaritan. We studied the Good Samaritan. We looked at Esther during God in Country. Um, anybody else? I mean, obviously, we've talked a little bit about Joshua and Caleb possessing the promised land. And, of course, there, there's a, a magnificent hero that we may have left out, um, Jesus. Praise the Lord. No, we, we didn't forget about Jesus. Um, uh, but, but it's been a wonderful time. Have you all enjoyed yourself the past few weeks? And and I'm sure there's a lot of, uh, we could go all, 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 um, all year, you know, uh, just studying different ones. But um, we're going to continue throughout this summer. And so this, this morning, we're going to check another one out. Are you ready? Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. Anybody want to take a wild guess who we're going to look at today? What? Come on, take a wild guess. If you have a Bible that has... Um, Okay, whatever. Luke chapter 1, you're like, I ain't saying the wrong answer, Pastor. You ain't going to get me in that. Luke 1, verse 26. It says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was, now y'all know, who? Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for, who, for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. How many know it's all right to to study this story when it's not Christmas? That's right. Okay. Um, We see a lot of things in here, and I'll point out a few things. But but, but clearly, um, this is an amazing thing going on, correct? Um, an angel shows up to, to a, a virgin girl named Mary, and, and um, when he shows up to her, he, he says, rejoice, highly favored one, right? The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And, and it's interesting that she, she's uh, uh, troubled, but she's not troubled by, by seeing him. She's troubled by his words. Like, so what kind of greeting is this, my man? You know, what, what are you, what are you, what are you, uh, what are you showing up for? What you got to say? And, and he says, do not be afraid. You found favor with God. He says, and you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. So call his name Jesus and he will be great, right? Called the son of the highest. 
She said, how can this be? Since I do not know a man. That means she's, I mean, she's a virgin. She's never had sex before. So she's like, there's, there's no way this is possible. And he says, this is how it's going to happen. It's going to be, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be a miracle. It's going to be a miracle. By the Holy Spirit, you shall conceive a son. And he will not only just be a son, he's going to be the son of God. He's going to be the son of God. Amen. So this is, this is a pretty awesome uh, story, a true story here. It's not made up, not make-believe, not a nice Christian you know, fable or whatever. This, this really happened. Uh, but there's a few things you need to know uh, about Mary. I mean, according to uh, biblical culture, Jewish culture, um, you know, she, she's, she's engaged to be married to a man by the name of Joseph. And in that time and in that, that, uh, that world, you would get married between the ages of 12, 13, and 14. So, so Mary, um, you know, in, in our minds, when you see Mary or you see her in the movies, she's like, what, 25, 26? But when you, when you talk about Mary and an angel showing up to Mary, we're talking about like a 13-year-old. I mean, at, at, at best, oldest, in the commentaries I read, maybe 14 years old. 14 years old. So when they went through puberty, you're all right. It's, it's, it's time to get married. It's time to get married, right? And so this is a very, very young, very young girl. Now, I have a daughter who's, who's 11 years old, so this hits home for me really close because you can imagine, I mean, at that age, at that age, right? It's a very, very young age where the angel shows up to her and says this to her, says this to her. Now, she's about to get married. If you can imagine what's going on in that process, the process back then was a lot bigger than it is now, but still, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. She's preparing uh, to be married to Joseph, to spend her life with him. She's preparing to be a wife, one day to be a mother. She's preparing for a whole new life with Joseph, a good man, a good man, a devout man, a good guy, right? She's preparing for all of this, and an angel shows up and says all of this to her. Now, if you just put yourself in her shoes for a moment, um, this is really out of the box, right? Really out of the box. Why? Well, I mean, there's, there's a lot of reasons because of a, a few things I've already mentioned, but one, you're so young. Two, you're, you're about to get married. And, and three, you're, you're going to be pregnant with the son of the, the living God, son of God, and it's going to be immaculate. <laughs> All right. All right. Now, I think it's pretty easy for, for most of us to just kind of read the rest of the story and, and get down to verse 38 and really uh, celebrate what she said. But uh, what is she saying when she says, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be unto me according to your word. What is she really saying? Let it, I mean... What, what is being said when she says that? She hadn't had a conversation with Joseph yet, has she? She hadn't talked to mom and pop either, has she? Do you know that the town she's living in, Nazareth, at, at max had about 400 people in it? 400 people. Now, you can imagine the talk that's going to go on in a town of 400 people. I mean, it's like, what, Forest Hill, four or 500 people. It's just a small little town, right? A small town. Everybody knows everything about everybody, right? Don't take long to figure it out. Just have coffee one morning somewhere, and you'll figure out what's going on in the town. I mean, we live in Alexandria. It's a small town, but, man, even smaller than that, everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows their name, what's going on with their family, with their house. Imagine she has an idea the kind of ridicule, the kind of talk that's going to go on, what's going to be happening, what, what's going what, What's Joseph going to say? What's mom and dad going to say? What's my family going to say? What's going to be going on? So for, for her to say, right, behold, the maidservant of the Lord, be unto me according to our word, we're thinking of that you let the miracle happen. But for her to say, hey, I'm your servant, God, she's saying more than just, you know, um, I'll have the baby. What is she saying? I give my life. I surrender everything. I lay down my marriage. I lay down my future. I lay down 
my reputation. Talk about a woman of strength and courage. She had strength and courage, not just because she had the baby. (laughs) She had strength and courage because she endured months of talk. Thank God for Joseph. He was a good man. Notice, though, what Mary says. She says, behold, behold. We always skip this first part, the maidservant of the Lord. We go straight to let it be unto me according to your word, which I love that, by the way. But she says, behold, the first thing she says is, behold, the maidservant of the Lord. The first thing she says is what? Lord, I'm your servant. That's what what'd she say? Lord, I'm your servant. What is she saying? God, use me. You can use me. Now, her next step, which is being in me according to your word, is that faith kicking in that I'll Let's have, let's, let's have this supernatural miracle happen. But our first step was a step of humility, of submission, and servanthood to God. You know, God didn't pick Mary because she's cute. Because it's a nice name. and I mean, it's a, it's a good name. It means lady, you know. There's a, there's a lot of good things to that. He didn't pick her because, uh, you know, she had a good personality, you know. I mean, of all the women that he could have picked, right, at any time in history that he could have chosen, he picks this one girl, Mary, right? Anybody remember when you had your first kid, if you have kids? Anybody remember when you have your, had your first kid, even a father or mother, if you remember that? Um, Anybody remember the first time you left your child with someone for the first time? Anybody remember that? Anybody? Some of y'all still haven't done it yet. You'll find out. Right? I mean, who you leave your child, even now, of course, if, but it's, it's a big deal, right? I mean, you know, it's a big deal, especially if you, you love them. <laughs> See, I'm like, eh, I'm still working on that. Uh, if you love them and you want them to be taken care of and, right, protected, uh, fed, right? All of these things, and you, you, you really care about the counsel that they're going to receive, who's going to be speaking into their life, what's going to be happening, what, what that person is going to allow to be watched on TV, or where they're going to take them, where they're going to eat, what kind of car they're going to be riding in. I, I think of all of these kinds. Anybody think of them? You'd be thinking of all of these kinds of things because you love your child, right? Now, the Almighty God trusted his only begotten Son to come to this earth in the house with Mary. There must have been something more about Mary than just, Lord, I believe you. Okay, fine, do it. Make it happen. All right, I'll do it, you know. No, no. There's something in her heart. There's something about her attitude. There's something about her willingness. There's something about the way she honors God and his law and his statutes. There's something about the plan and purpose of God that that she wanted in her life that was bigger than just, Lord, let the miracle happen in me. It was, Lord, I'm your servant. Whatever you want, whatever you want to happen, that's what I want to happen. And God says, I've seen this girl. I know her heart. There's something about her that I can fully trust my son being raised in her house. Woo. Right? I mean, surely uh, God wouldn't let his son be raised in a house where he has a mother who's going to speak all kind of cursing over him. (laughs) something about about Mary that that God sees you know scripture says that man looks on the outward appearance but God looks on the what that means God can see past all of what everyone else sees and what everyone else uh, sees that you are showing and revealing and he sees right to the inside he sees right to the inside and he saw right to the inside of Mary and he said I like that girl I like that girl. I like that girl. Behold, maidservant of the Lord. Well, what 
what happens next? Well, obviously she talked about Elizabeth. Who's Elizabeth? Elizabeth's her cousin, right? Elizabeth is going to have a child by the name of anybody know? John the Baptist. All right, be John the Baptist. So since you're right there, just, just look, look at the next chapter. Luke, uh, no, same chapter, excuse me, same, just a little, uh, a little further down. Luke chapter 1, right? She, she goes to Elizabeth's house for a little visit. I mean, you know, little visits are different back then than they are now. She stayed three months. <laughs> That's a long visit. I say, hey, now, you're my cousin and everything, but you eating me out of house and home. It's time to go back. A little different, though. The culture is different that time. Some of those trips they would make are a little harder to take, too. Right? See, you work hard to get somewhere. You're going to stay there a little while. She shows up at Elizabeth's house, and boy, the Elizabeth baby jumps within her. She's filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 45. Elizabeth says this, blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Now, what is the first thing that, that Mary says in response to what Elizabeth has said? What does Mary say? You got that right, baby. God picked me. <laughs> Woo, I am special. Highly favored of the Lord. I'm going to have Jesus. He's going to be the son of God. The Messiah is coming through my belly. It's going to be awesome. Is that what she says? That's what most people would say nowadays. They're like, yeah, look at me. Look at me. Look what God is doing in my life. What does she say in response to her, her, to Elizabeth saying there shall be a fulfillment? What does she say? My soul magnifies the Lord. She don't have a microphone. She's not on a stage. She's at her house. And she breaks out into song. <laughs> Isn't that something? My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maid servant. Well, the first thing she says is what? Oh, man, God is good. He's awesome. He's mighty. Let him be exalted. Let him be exalted. He's seen me where I thought nobody could see me in a small little town in Nazareth. I'm just going about my way. I'm just going to marry Joseph, have a good life, you know, do my thing. And God saw me, for behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. She didn't forget, though. You're right about that. Now notice this in verse 49. It says, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He who is mighty has done what? He's done great things for me. Holy is his name. He who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Praise God. Well, what, what a magnificent look into Mary's heart. Right? She didn't look at Elizabeth and go, well, you know, you're old. You finally got one. Praise God. Right? But I, I'm having the Messiah, so I'm a little better than you. No. They're rejoicing with each other in the fulfillment of God's promise at the same time. And Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord. Now, if this was... Uh, the end, it would be kind of you know, beautiful as far as, you know, there's a song going on in here. There's, you know, it's at the house, it's wonderful. But, you know, Mary ends up having Jesus in, in a manger, right? She has Jesus in a manger and kind of wild circumstances, right? There's no room for him at the end. It's just a little, you wouldn't think that's the way Jesus would come, right? I don't think most anybody thought that's the way Jesus would come, like in a manger, he should be born in a palace, right? He's the king of kings, lord of lords. He's born in a, in a manger. And, you know, it just seems like not, 
not the best of circumstances. They're having to kind of run around because, you know, the, the head guy at the time was wanting to kill all the babies because he heard there's a king born. So, I mean, it's just this kind of just wild situation going on. And Mary, there's something about her, though, that is just steadfast in faith and pure in heart. Steadfast in faith and pure in heart. The scripture doesn't give a whole lot of what Mary has said in her life, but what is revealed is pretty powerful, right? The song that she sings and what she says, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, be it unto me according to your word. Can you imagine raising Jesus, though? It's a little pressure. Right? I mean, angels showed up to shepherds at his birth and said, this kid's going to bring glad tidings of great joy into all people, right? And they came and told her about it. It says, Mary uh, pondered these things in her heart, (laughs) right? What about at 12 years old? They all went to Jerusalem. The whole family went to Jerusalem. And and, uh, they all go there, Passover feast. They're leaving town and they all kind of caravan together. Everybody would caravan together. And, and so Jesus, they realize he's not there. He's not in the caravan. He's still in Jerusalem. They go back to find him. It takes them three days to find Jesus. What kind of a mother would you feel like if that was you? Kind of lost Jesus for three days, man. I mean, angels showed up and all kind of immaculate conception, and I lost it, right? It's just, it's just pathetic. Talk about beating yourself up for a few days, you know. What have we done? But again, he's, he's 12 years old, and so he's kind of at that age where he's becoming a man. They walk into the temple there, and where, where have you been? You've had me and your dad. We've been anxious. We've been messed up, man. Woo! Right? And he's like, why did you, what, you know, did you not know? I'd be about my father's business. It says, Scripture says, They did not understand what he said. But it says that Mary kept these things in her heart. Now, Mary's got a lot going on on the inside, and she manages to keep it right. What if he's your little boy and he said that to you? I'm about my father's business. Like, boy, I'm going to grab your ear, buddy. I'm going to show you where we're taking you back to father's house, right? That's about the only glimpse we get really into Jesus' childhood, adolescence, right? So for 30 years per se, right, 30 years. I mean, if I was married, I'd be like, come on, boy. I think that's one of the reasons she encouraged him to turn the water into wine or do something, right, at this first miracle. Like, do something. It's like, it's been 30 years. Do something, man. I went through all that ridicule and we traveled around and angels showed up and people brought you gifts and all kind of stuff and you're just making tables and chairs. Please do something. Jesus is like, it's not my time. It's like, whatever he says to do, he doesn't do it, okay? Because it might be his time and he just don't know it. You, you can imagine a mama kind of thinking that way like, well, he... He's just a little off on the Holy Spirit right now, but I got the Holy Spirit in me too, and it's time. Mary keeps her heart right, though, through it all. Jesus enters full-time ministry, per se, his traveling ministry, and teaching and healing and casting out devils at about 30 years old, Right? How happy would you be if you were Mary, right? You'd be like, whoo, that's my boy, right? That's my boy. All those people that were healed, masses gathering around him. I hear the stories. Man, this is awesome. My son, yeah, knew it was going to happen. Knew it. I just, I believed all these years, 30 years, and now it's coming to pass. Now everybody else can see what I've been believing and pondering all these years. Ah, Everybody else can see it now, right? I think I'm going to go make a visit to one of his meetings. 
I'm going to go visit Jesus at one of his meetings. I, I want to go to one of those big ones where all the crowd's at, you know, and show up, us and the family. It's going to be a reunion when we show up, right? Now, in case you didn't know this, Jesus had at least six brothers and sisters. Four brothers, and then one scripture says, and sisters. So he had at least to have two. So Mary didn't just have Jesus. She has seven kids at least, seven. And at one point, it says all the brothers didn't believe. <laughs> anyway, that's another point. So they're going to show up and see Jesus at, at one of his meetings. Boy, can you imagine a big old crowd walking in, right? She's trying to get in, can't really find room. There's no room, so she sends word out. Tell Jesus his mother's here. Mama's here. Mama's here. She wants to, <laughs> I made you some cornbread. <laughs> right brought your favorite meal and a little goodie box while you're traveling new toothbrush and some toothpaste you know what I mean just kind of you can imagine a mama's thinking no matter how old you are you're still my son I can just kind of see this moment where she's feeling like all this is going to pay off in this moment when my son says this is my amazing mother she raised me, trained me, taught me everything that I know, and these are my wonderful brothers. They show up. They get the word to Jesus. Jesus, your mother is here. Your brothers are here. He says, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Those that do the will of God, they are my mother." And they are my brothers. And the rest, of, it don't say anything else about Mary after that. Not like, but escort her in anyway. No. Now, if you was his mama. <laughs> at that moment, whoo, you'd be huffing and puffing, right? You'd be like, fff, 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 fff. I had you. When I had you, there was cows around. <laughs> Not Mary. Not Mary. She keeps her heart right in that moment. <sighs> Scripture says in Psalms, uh, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. And Mary's strength and courage, I believe, wasn't just in her believing that it could come to pass, but her strength and courage even while it is coming to pass. Right? Well, Jesus finally, you know, comes home. Well, Scripture says the prophet's not welcome in his own home, so he comes home, and it's not like a big greeting. It's not like American Idol where they come back home for the home visit, and everybody's like in the streets, and, woo, we're glad you're back, and they go to their old high school, and you know what I mean, have a big, exciting moment, and everybody, you know, celebrates, and we love you, Jesus, and no, it's not really happening. They start talking bad about him. Imagine if you were his mother in that moment. They're all talking bad about your son in your own hometown. You'd be like, oh, no, you're about to die today. Right? When you see here, behold the maidservant of the Lord, Mary's willing to see the big picture. She's pondering things in her heart. What she's thinking about, what she's meditating on, the things that God has spoken and the things that he's promised and the things that the angel has said, have said all of these things and the things that are coming to pass. And, you know, Mary studied scripture. She's seen the Old Testament prophecies and she knows there's some things that are going to happen. Imagine if you were Mary when, when you begin to hear word back from those who were in Jesus' inner circle that Jesus has said two days after Passover, I'm going to be crucified. Oh. <sighs> If you were a mama, oh, no. What about when Jesus is betrayed and put on trial? Your son on trial. What about when his flesh is being ripped off of him as he's beaten? 
with a whip as your son. He's put on a cross, crucified for all to see the shame. Thought he was the son of God. People talking like that. Thought, wow, if he's the son of God, he should, you know, he should do something about his situation then. Right? But Mary. I believe the things that she pondered in her heart are some of the things that kept her. Things that the angels said, things that have been prophesied, things that have been spoken. Right? And on the cross before Jesus ultimately gives his life, he looks at his mama. He looks at his mama. He says, behold your son. Wow. Of all the things he could have said, we, you know, we know he said, you know, Father, forgive them, they know what they do. Lord, why have you forsaken me? But what a, uh, I don't know how to say it, a very uh, human moment. He didn't say, I'm the son of God. Everybody worship me right now. In that moment, he looks at his mom. He says, behold, your son. And he looked at the apostle John. He said, behold your mother. Did you take care of mama? Before Jesus went to the cross, he prayed a, uh, a prayer. It's a prayer of consecration. Three times at least, we know. Three times. It's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's asked his disciples to pray, and they all fall asleep, you know. Can't stay awake. Jesus says, you know, come on, y'all. Just an hour. Can you give me an hour, please? But he goes back, and he prays, and he prays three times. He says, any other way, Lord? Let it be that way, but if, if there's no other way, not my will, but yours be done in me. Not my will, but yours be done in me twice. Not my will, but yours be done in me three times. Not my will, but yours be done in me. Do you know that's, that's pretty much what Mary said when the angel came up to her? She said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Whatever your word is, whatever your will is, let it be. Let it be. You know, Jesus said something in his teaching. He said, whoever uh, loves your mother or your, your kids, brothers or sisters more than me, he says, they're not worthy of me. That's a hard word, isn't it? If you love, but he says, whoever tries to keep his life, save his life, he says, will lose it. He said, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he's just going to find it. And Jesus demonstrated this. Mary demonstrated this. Not my will, not my life, not, not, not me, but whatever God wants to be done. In me. Right? What is our culture taken up in now? Everything's about me. Absolutely everything is about me. I don't have anything wrong with selfies. We do them in here sometimes just for fun, but everything's about me. I'd like to have more pictures of me, please. I'd like people to see me more often. Right? Most people don't go to the gym to work out for exercise. They go to the gym to work out because they want to look better. I want to, and they want mirrors all around them to see at the same time. Look at me. I like to look at me. I'm going to take pictures of me. Hope everybody looks at me. All right, just a lot, a lot of me. You know, not all that's bad. I'm just saying, generally, everything is about self. What makes me comfortable? What makes me feel good? What makes me happy? So a message like this where it's, it's bigger than you, y'all. God's plan is bigger than just you. You get to be part of what God is doing. And whatever part he wants you to play, that's the part you should be willing to play. Behold, Lord, your servant. Whatever you want, that's what I'll do. Whether it seems big, 
whether it seems small, whether it means living in Nazareth, whether it means going to Jerusalem, whether it means staying in Alexandria or going to Dallas or New York or Los Angeles or whatever it is. Lord, whatever you want in me, that's what I want in me. Right? You know, if Jesus didn't have this understanding and didn't live like this, he wouldn't have went to the cross. It wasn't comfortable. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for Mary either. Can we look at one more thing about Mary? Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 and, and just a few verses down. I want you to see this. I want you to see this. Acts chapter 1, all right? And keep in mind, all right, what we're about to read is after Jesus has been raised from the dead, after he's ascended in glory, all right? He's come through her, lived his life, done his ministry, gone to the cross, been raised from the dead, right? And here we go. Verse 14, Acts chapter 1. Man, why am I in Acts chapter 16? Maybe there's something in there I hadn't seen yet. Verse 14. It says, And these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Got the fellas in there too. That's nice. The upper room. But what happens in the upper room? Well, you read the rest of the book of Acts, and you know, the Holy Spirit's poured out. They all get filled up with the Holy Spirit, speaking other tongues. Man, they're empowered to do what God has called them to do for this next dispensation, this next season, right? Mary, from start to finish, is in faith. Right here, she's not desiring to be worshipped. She's not desiring to be prayed to. She submitted to the will of God. She came there to pray herself. She came there to sing herself. You know what she is? A Christian. A follower of Christ. A disciple of Jesus. More than just the mother She's a follower in the family. She continues. To me, this speaks as loud as just about anything else about her. That after it's all said and done, she could have said, whew, I did my part, right? Have you ever been there? Like, whew, that was hard. That was difficult. But he, man, he was raised from the dead. Yes, right? He's gone now. Whew, and I can just enjoy my grandkids. No, she's praying. She's in the upper room, and she gets filled with the Holy Spirit. Boom. I ain't done yet. I'm getting filled up. I just believe there's something about God that knew all of this from the beginning. That Mary, my girl, she ain't doing this for the fortune, for the fame. She ain't doing this to be called a saint. She's not going to be willing because of all of the the people talking about her good for years to come and forever. She's going to do this because she loves me. She's going to keep her heart right all the way. And she's going to follow through. Well, what can you learn about that? (laughs) A little bit of everything, huh? Behold, your servant, Lord. Behold your servant. Can I close with this? Psalm 35 and verse uh, 27. Love this scripture. Psalm 35, verse 27. I'm Matt and April. If y'all just go ahead and come up, that'd be good. 
Psalm 35, verse 27. Y'all got it? Wonderful, wonderful verse. It says, let them shout for joy and be, be glad who favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. What is this saying? Well, a lot of good things. Get happy, be excited. Those who are serving, uh, who favor God's righteous cause, say continually, let the Lord be magnified. Isn't that what Mary said? Let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. His servant. You know, pros- prosperity isn't about uh, you serving prosperity. Did you know that? It's not about you serving prosperity. For Mary, what was it? God's provision every step of the way. There's a place to stay. People showed up miraculously to bring provision for us in our journey. Everywhere we went, God showed up right on time. Everywhere we go, praise God. Right? He says at the very end of the verse, who has pleasure in the prosperity of what? His what? His what? Right? It's a lot of people who want God to prosper what they set their hand to. They just don't keep their heart right. Sometimes they don't keep their hands clean. Get involved in all kinds of stuff, shouldn't be involved in, have all kinds of stuff going on on the inside, right? That just ain't right. So, Lord, prosper me. Right here it says, Lord, you take pleasure in the prosperity of your servant. I'm favoring your righteous cause on this earth. I know that's not comfortable. I know that's not necessarily easy. It may not even be all that exciting at the very moment, right? But God has a great plan for you. And he has a cause here on this earth, right? Mary's a hero. She's a hero of the faith. Wouldn't you agree? She's a hero of the faith. Not exclusively because she had Jesus, but because of her faith, her willingness, her obedience, her heart, her attitude from beginning all the way through. Amazing. Any grandmothers out there inspired to be like, man, I want to be in the upper room. This this is my Greatest moment right here to shine. Woo! I'm going to keep moving forward. I mean, I'm going to be in my place. Tell you what. If you'll keep your heart right. If you'll be willing. Be willing. If you think back to a little bit earlier in the service, during the offering, that scripture where it says, the Lord says, I I will declare some things and then they will spring forth. I'm gonna tell you about them, but I will declare some things. What is God saying? I've got some things for you. How many know God has some things for you? He has some things. He has desires for you. But before you can pick up what, what is his, you gotta lay down what's yours. Right? Mary shows up at a large gathering around Jesus and, boy, it seems to be ashamed. It, it would be shamed, so to speak, like, man. But yet, oh, no, big picture here. I'll keep the big picture. Brothers got all mad. There was a time when the brothers, I told you, didn't even believe. We don't believe in them. Oh, that Jesus, whew. How difficult would that be to try to hold your house together? The brothers don't believe your other son is Jesus, the Messiah. You do, they don't. That'd be a nice dinner conversation. I want us to sing this just for a couple minutes and we'll leave today, but I want you to take these last few minutes here. and I I want you to, to from your heart, all right? From your heart, why don't you just lay it down? Lay up, lay everything, lay everything down. 
may be a little inconvenient, may not seem comfortable, may seem like the Lord's disturbing my plan. My plan was what, Mary, have Joseph, you know, Mary Joseph, we have our kids, we do our thing, right? That's it. But maybe God has something else. Maybe God has something else. Something different, something bigger, something that you didn't plan, but God did. 